Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I've got another podcast for you today. I'm Peter B. Collins in San Francisco. And today I'm joined by Dr. Jeffrey Kay. He is a retired psychologist who's been moonlighting as a journalist for many years now. And he's covered a variety of topics in great detail with a a real objective approach to ferreting out the facts. He was based in San Francisco, but he recently retired to the big island of Hawaii, where he joins us uh, by Skype today. And uh, he's uh, on the island where Kilauea is currently uh, uh, spewing ash and lava, but Jeff is not uh, near the volcano itself, so he can join us uh, without being too worried about having to evacuate at any moment. Dr. Jeffrey Kay, welcome. Hi. Hi, Peter. Welcome. Thank you. Well, it's great to talk with you again. And uh, in a series of posts at Medium, uh, starting on uh, February the uh, uh, 20th, I have it, and also a subsequent piece on April the 3rd, and uh, we will embed your articles with this podcast package at Who, What, Why. But you have uncovered some fascinating uh, history about the use by the United States of bioweapons in the war on North Korea back in the 1950s. And, Jeff, I find this a uh, fascinating uh, context for the current uh, discussions that are underway between North and South Korea and the impending summit between uh, Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. So, first of all, tell us a little bit about the big picture, because, you know, I was born in 1953, and I really only have received information uh, about the Korean War. And you have provided important new details uh, about uh, the American military operations and also about the alleged brainwashing of captured American soldiers, which we'll get to in a bit. But what first drew your interest to this uh, this subject and to digging up the information that you have shared with us? Well, you know, they don't call the for- Korean War the Forgotten War for nothing. The leaders of the United States would like people to forget what happened in Korea because uh, in terms of the U.S. campaign, because it was one war crime after another. Now this, these war crimes have not been totally uh, wiped off the map. And in fact, there are books written about the Korean War that describe the bombing campaigns, the air campaigns. The mainstream media will publish these days admissions that the United States totally flattened North Korea with aerial campaign. I was just reading the other day in a document um, the U.S. admission that they flew over half a million air sorties over North Korea. Um, they dropped more tonnage of bombs on North Korea uh, per square mile or per person than they any, was done in any other war ever. Um, the people were reduced to using ox carts and um, living in tunnels. Even General MacArthur himself, Dolikos, who wanted a nuclear war against China, you know, when testifying to Congress, told him that when he actually went to North Korea and looked after the invasion at Incheon and they advanced to the Yalu River, you know, that he was sickened. I mean, he was made nauseous by the destruction that he saw. I and mean, it didn't make him stop it, but it just gives you an idea that if even MacArthur is sickened, how horrible was this? But one of the main things um, that the United States kept secret was the use of biological weapons um, against uh, the Koreans and the Chinese, who, of course, had entered the war in support of the North Koreans in 19, uh, late 1950. And um, the reason they did this, of course, is because it was considered uh, a war crime by most of the world. The United States, however, of course, had not at that time signed the uh, um, treaty against the use of uh, biological weaponry um, at that time. But even so, it was understood that it was, um, you know, that this was something that sickened people when they heard about it, you know, making people ill on purpose. It was a perversion of science, a perversion of medicine. And um, in Nuremberg, uh, Nazi doctors, some of whom, in fact, did experiments on precisely this kind of thing, were... um, were jailed or sentenced to death. And, so, and Jeff, was, the, the, mm-hmm. key, the key decision makers at the time were President Harry Truman and the Dulles brothers, John and Allen. Is, is that a correct uh, assertion here? 
Well, that's, uh, I would add in very importantly, because it's in, um, I mean, in the end, it ha it's hard to believe Truman didn't sign off on this. Really very difficult to believe. But uh, um, you know, the Dulles brothers, you know, certainly the CIA was involved in these operations in the covert aspect. This was a covert campaign. But the U.S. military really bears, from what I can see personally, looking at the documents as I still continue to go through them, in conjunction with the CIA. I mean, they work together. But the, the, the sign-off or the orders for the campaign, according to uh, Colonel Frank Schwabel, who was chief of staff uh, for uh, uh, the Marines in uh, um, regiments in, um, in North Korea at that time, who was later captured by the North Koreans, or the Chinese rather, um, told them that the Joint Chiefs of Staff in October 1951 gave clearance for the use of a uh, biological weapon campaign. Now, I'll tell you something that no one has read because I haven't published on it yet, but I would re retrieve from the National Archives a document um, that was uh, in their OSS files, that's the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA, uh -huh. that in fact the Joint Chiefs of Staff had also given clearance for the use of biological weaponry against plants. Um, not widely known, but not uh, aspect of biological warfare is it's not always used against people. It's also used against plants and animals because um, you're using this type of warfare against uh, the civilian populations or against a nation state. So if, uh, you know, if you live off of rice and you can deliver um, tons of biological and chemical materials like defoliants, like Agent Orange, which was done during the Vietnam War, then uh, you know that's another form of attack against a nation. And this was cleared for use um, at the end of World War II. Nobody knows this yet, but now you know it. Mm -hmm. And I will publish on it, and people can read the document. It's not online currently. I will put it online. Now, um, now Jeff, if you would, give us a, a brief inventory of these biological weapons that surface in the documents, and then we'll talk about the origin of the report, uh, the International Scientific Commission. Okay. The main thing uh, to understand about the, the weaponry that was used is that the decision, and, and certainly the first phase of the biological war campaign of the United States was experimental in nature. And they used, they decided to use Apparently, they used some aerosolization, that is, they sprayed um, toxic substances, you know, uh, germs, if you will, over you know, areas of land. Uh, they were particularly uh, interested, well, this is when it became operational later. When it became operational later, they were particularly interested in bombing areas that were close to railway lines, because railway transit was the way, you know, uh, the North Koreans and the Chinese moved around ordnance and supplies and military people. Um, so they wanted to, they would come in and they would bomb an area, a strategic area, such as an air, uh, a railway yard. And then uh, at the end, they would come at the very close of it, they dropped the uh, biological weaponry so that disease, you know, when workers came in to clean up and, and, and fix up the railway lines so they could be used again, they would uh, hopefully, from the U.S. standpoint, be inoculated with plague you know, or, or some other terrible disease, uh, mm -hmm. dysentery. So you asked what kinds of weapons? Well, so, so they utilized the weaponry, the, the approach of the Unit 731 Japanese Biological Warfare Unit. And this was another reason why this was, had to be kept top secret. And this is very, very important, and it's, it's in my articles, that from the very beginning, the United States made a deal with uh, the Japanese um, Biological Warfare Unit, known as colloquially as Unit 731. It had a longer name. It was a, a fake cover name about preventing uh, disease and, uh, and doing water treatment. But there were a number of other units under this umbrella, Unit 100. There was, uh, they were in Singapore. You know, they weren't even just in Japan. They were, in, I mean, rather in Manchuria, which is where Unit 731 was centered. They were in China, they were in Singapore, they were in Pacific Islands. And what this massive unit did, uh, or a massive division um, of the Japanese Imperial Army, was they did experiments on tons, thousands of uh, prisoners that were captured, um, some of them just common criminals, 
um, or just or political dissidents in many cases. Some of them, of course, prisoners of war, including American prisoners of war, by the way. And uh, they uh, did experiments to see how lethal um, their diseases that they were brewing up in vats in, in secret, uh, you know, in Harbin, um, China, where their headquarters was and other places. And then dice, in some cases, dissecting the prisoners alive uh, to see how the disease progressed. They wanted to learn everything without any, re any inhibitions of the normal medical ethics that would um, be involved. The United States after, you know, was aware of this going on, and there are documents about that as they became more and more aware. And when the Americans first uh, came to Japan for the occupation, one of the very first things they did was track down the people involved. They wanted to interview them and, and the, uh, find out what their biological war campaign was about and uh, I mean, in full detail. And then they offered them amnesty, even though these people were high war criminals who had done some of the worst types of, uh, of not, well, I think Nazi-like because it was, but uh, in fact, their prison, not one prisoner survived. After they were used, they were put in uh, um, ovens and they were um, cremate, cremated, they were incinerated, mm -hmm. uh, just like at the concentration camps. Now, Jeff, and this, the, this disclosure about Unit 731 uh, is yeah. very much news to me, and I was aware that the CIA uh, recruited many Nazi scientists for uh, missile programs and uh, nuclear development programs, but I had never heard of Unit 731, and you write about how uh, yeah. it was confirmed in 1999 that the U.S. granted amnesty to the chief of Unit 731, General Shiro Ishii, uh, and yeah. some of his associates. And uh, you also say that it had been a secret for years, but it was first revealed by a journalist named John Powell in 1981 in the Bulletin of yeah. Atomic Scientists. So uh, the effort to keep this suppressed has been largely successful, would you say? Oh, absolutely. Uh, now, you know, there have been since books written um, that, um, you know, uh, the most prominent and most famous book, some of your listeners may be familiar with, is Factories of Death by, by a U.S. historian by the name of Sheldon Harris, uh, Japanese biological warfare, 1932 to 1945, and the American cover-up. Um, you know, this is published in a, a Rutledge. It's available, you know, at your favorite bookstore or online. And uh, there have been other books written. And, uh, you know, the, the details of, the, of this, you know, in fact, as the revelations came out around this, uh, believe it or not, it was uh, Diane Feinstein um, and a few other people who, uh, championed uh, this is shortly after the this came out after the revelations about the Nazis that you mentioned like an operation paperclip and other, others being mm -hmm. recruited by the US I think of that really came out from the class Barbie um, revelations in the 80s and um, the, uh, uh, the uh, a bill was passed and, and the declassification of a lot of documents took place in the 1990s leading to some of these books um, like Sheldon Harris's Factories of Death and others. And, you know, that you can read in, in great detail. In fact, the, the recent documentary Wormwood on HBO alludes to some of this, as well as to the covert campaign the U.S. Conduct, um, was conducting um, through Fort Detrick, with its headquarters really in Fort Detrick, uh, Maryland, which was the place where the U.S. testing and uh, of biological weaponry at least that was their headquarters. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, the CIA. Frank Olson was, in fact, a CIA agent, a doctor, uh, excuse me, not a doctor, scientist. Um, at some point he joined the, the, the CIA. I don't know um, when, but he did. And other CIA officials were utilizing Japanese technology among their own, of course, technology that they had been working on since 1941-42, the U.S. had begun its own big biological warfare campaign. In fact, people don't know this, but or if you know this, maybe you don't, that um, after the Manhattan Project, which was the scientific operation um, to, um, for the, to create an atom bomb, mm -hmm. that the second mo largest and most secret project the United States had going during World War II was, in fact, its biological warfare project which was hidden under a lot of very innocuous names like the War Service Board mm. 
and things like this. In fact, the, the, the campaign for a while, the Worst Service Board, which was running this biological warfare campaign itself, was hidden within the Social Security Department, no. or at least the same division. Yes, absolutely. I, 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 I'm not kidding you. <laughs> so it's very, you know, this thing is very covert. It's been hidden for years because, you know, that's what a covert operation is. We still don't know everything about the current um, torture program that was conducted by the U.S. Uh, under Bush Cheney because, you know, so much of it is still secret. And they argue about what they can declassify, say, about Gina Haspel. Why does any of it have to be? Why isn't it all declassified? What do they have to hide? Well, right. they uh, they have a lot to hide. I I think I know, that's exactly. that's pretty but clear that's another... from what from what has been uh, released or declassified to date. So, uh, Jeff, yeah. in a moment, I want to ask you because you yeah. you detail one of the uh, alleged American attacks using biological weapons in Kong yeah. Su, and and I want to get to that yeah. in a moment. But talk a little bit about how in the early 1950s, as you just described, the U.S. acquired some of this uh, bio-warfare technology from mm -hmm. the Japanese. They deployed it on uh -huh. a, a test basis in Korea, and then they, they kind of uh, made it a program. Uh, and this, this resulted in real-time protests from the Koreans and, I believe, from the Chinese as well, yes. that, that they had uh, uh, suspected that they were being subject to uh, these uh, bioweapons uh, being uh, deployed in the theater of war. And yes. that led to the creation of the International Scientific Commission, led by a British scientist of some uh, renown named Joseph Needham. And the ISC included scientists from uh, Sweden, France, Italy, and Brazil. So mm -hmm. uh, this was a, an international commission, and the U.S. Uh, didn't appear to cooperate with this commission. Is that correct? Well, I don't know to what degree they were asked to cooperate with the commission. The, uh, they certainly didn't stop the bombing when the members of the commission quite courageously entered North Korea and went to Pyongyang themselves to look at documents, talk to the scientists and doctors who had been evaluating the evidence that they had found about uh, biological warfare, and then later traveling to the far north of North Korea um, to interview some of the American flyers who were making, you know, who were confessing to the use of uh, biological warfare. No, the United States certainly, they denied and they vociferously attacked as lies um, and propaganda the you know pure propaganda, the the assertions of the North Koreans and the Chinese, and by the way, the Soviets too, who were Soviet Union was uh, um, also participating in these charges. Um, the uh, so you were mentioning the technology. I, technology. I, forget, I wanted to make one important point. So the Japanese technology, in other words, was the use of insect vectors. Is the term scientific term what it's used? In other words, the insects become the place uh, use insects to infect people mm -hmm. um, or to in some cases to infect other insects and it gets kind of diabolical who then infect other people in other words, it, it, the, the ecology of the use of this can get intricate but in general uh, so for instance in the article you mentioned they used um, uh, fleas human fleas the species that preys on humans pulex irritans um, to and dump them in, in areas uh, where Human beings might come in contact with them that were already pre, you know, pre inoculated with the human plague virus to spread plague. Uh, that's one way in which you can. And this had been done earlier by the Japanese in China, um, quite famously in 1941 at a place called Changte, um, that uh, uh, was documented. And in fact, the same ja Chinese scientist at that time, who was not a communist, by the way, but uh, was. Um, had uh, written a report on this that came to the attention of the Americans, and it was this report of wide-scale Japanese use, operational use of biological warfare, not just research, that scared the Americans and precipitated in 1941 the beginnings of this massive scaling up of biological warfare research and capacity by the Americans. Um, uh, it gets more complex. Uh, there's not enough time to go into it because it wasn't just the Americans. It was also the Canadians and the British who were mm. involved in these kind of research. In the article, I quote 
The report concluded that the U.S. had used a number of biological weapons, including use of anthrax, plague, and cholera, disseminated by over a dozen different devices or methods, including spraying, porcelain bombs, self-destroying paper containers uh, with a uh, paper... Oh, I'm jumping to the Parachute. next page here. <laughs> uh, Parachute. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. And and so these are, you know, it, it's diabolical, but also kind of clever uh, what what they were doing. And tell us how you acquired a copy of this ISC report, Jeffrey. Well, you had asked me before how I got interested in all this. And the way I became interested was that the tales of the tortured airmen or supposedly tortured airmen um, was used as um, an example of what SEER was. SEER was the um, survival escape uh, resistance evasion program of the U.S. military to um, protect captured American soldiers and officers in particular um, and train them how to resist torture or interrogation and interrogation. And um, as I'd read the histories of these things, and they'd say, well, the Sierra people, they got their, they, they, you know, they took as their model the Chinese torture used on these American airmen to give false charges of biological warfare during World, uh, the Korean War. And so I thought, well, wow, what a story. Wow, that's interesting. I'd like to read about it more. As I did so, I'd see that, you know, I'm always someone who's looking for the original documents because you can't always trust the spin that somebody is giving you. You really have to read a lot, to, to, especially in controversial areas, to, 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 to form your own opinion. And I encourage all your readers to do that. That's why I like to publish documents with what I write. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, uh, I couldn't find it. I could not find this, this, this um, International Scientific Commission report anywhere. Um, I couldn't find it in a library. I'd write to a library. Oh, the, it was the, the report. You, you say you have it. Well, it's missing. What? It's missing. Or um, later when I found, uh, um, you know, so I, I looked, started to look at these online book places, like Amazon, you know, ABE books, etc. And I, uh, they didn't have it either. But you could set up a wish list. <laughs> you know, if you ever hear it, you know, if that ever comes in, email me. And in fact, that's how I got the report. Really? And you it got it sim as simple as that. You ABE got it from a books. wish list. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. Or, or uh, I don't think wish list is the proper term, but uh -huh. it's you, you, an alert. Yeah. You know, that the, the, the book is somebody selling this book. And so first I got the report. The report itself is the first 60 pages or actually it's 60 pages roughly long. And it's itself very fascinating. And it's really very compactly summarizes the entire situation. Um, it's, it's really worth reading. Um, but what I was really jonesing for, if you will, was the hundreds of pages of documentation that accompanied that report, the so-called appendices to the International Scientific Commission report, because in there, I would need that to assess the evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Here, I, I didn't have evidence. I had a report. Where's the evidence? It would be as if, you know, like we have this executive summary on the torture report released by the Senate Select Committee of Intelligence on the CIA program. But they don't want to release the thousands of pages of documentation that go with it. That's where the meat, that's where you're really going to find out what's mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I, I kept searching and searching. And after a period of, you know, uh, some years, like three or four years, finally one of them came up for sale and I purchased it. And, and, and I read it. And uh, as I began to look into it, I was, I was amazed. I was astounded at the level of detail, the scientific rigor, which I had read in a few places that they had, which is not surprising. The man who led the commission, Joseph Needham, was one of the foremost British scientists of his day. He was a biochemist by training um, and had contributed, made major contributions to our understanding of, of human um, cellular and um, 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 uh, organism development back in the 1920s. And um, later became uh, had, went to China, was there as a major British scientific representative to Chinese scientists and doctors during World War II. And it was under it was at that time that he came in contact with the Japanese Unit you know, 731 biological warfare campaign. So he knew firsthand what was going on. No doubt he reported that back to the British as well. Now, Jeff, and so I, he, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I wanted to interject here that yeah, I, I have seen. 
uh, you know, a lot of evidence about Fort Detrick, about the covert programs of the 1950s, MK Ultra. Uh, you have co-authored pieces with H.P. Alberelli, uh, who did a deep, deep dive on the Frank Olson mm -hmm. case and published a book called A Terrible Mistake, which I continue to recommend. But the biggest yeah. takeaway from your analysis of the ISC report is that you think that the allegations uh, widely believed, including by me, that uh, m many of the Americans who were captured by North Korea were subject to a very uh, sophisticated brainwashing program, that they used torture and interrogation techniques, some of which uh, showed up with Mitchell and Jessen, uh, you know, into the next century. Uh, but uh, the idea that Americans were tortured and brainwashed by the North Koreans is something that I took as an article of faith because it has been repeated so many times. Uh, and, yes. and let me briefly cite that uh, mm -hmm. I interviewed an expert on uh, coercive persuasion, Dr. Margaret Singer, back in the mm -hmm. 1970s, related yeah. to the use of these some of these tactics by Reverend Moon and the Unification Church, uh, to some extent by... Uh, other groups that were at that time recruiting young people. And and so Margaret Singer based a lot of her research on Moon's use of coercive uh, persuasion on her body of work related to the Korean War. So for me, this was something that was always a matter of fact. And you say this deserves a, a pretty good reevaluation. Well, yes. I mean, what we don't have there, and, and, and this led me to another search for documents, is that uh, that all sounds good. So where is the, where are the confessions, the brainwashed, tortured confessions of these soldiers and these military men? They should be, if, if they should be put forth because they are, you know, if we really want to condemn the Chinese and North Koreans for torture, let's present the evidence to the world. They love to do that when they have it. They didn't have it. Instead, what they had were a series of confessions that, to, if you read them today, um, sound very straightforward. There are um, Some of them are published uh, within the International Scientific Commission report, and they comment upon them. Some There are actually videotapes of these that you can find online at YouTube. You can watch them yourself and listen to the anguish of these Airmen, as they talk about how they were sickened when they were told that they had to, that they were conducting germ warfare, and it made them sick to their stomach, that the United States government would 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 be involved in such a thing. But that you know, but it, but Mark, when you were interviewing Margaret Singer, there was no YouTube, mm -hmm. and these videos weren't around, and and even to this day, very difficult to find. I finally tracked down the only copy of the nineteen. Uh, uh, the Chinese published 19 uh, depositions of 19 uh, U.S. airmen, and the, there was a supplement with a few others in 1952-53. Um, and there wasn't one copy in the United States Library anywhere. Wow. And it was published in English, by the way, hmm. and distributed because there wasn't one copy in a U.S. library. I, I finally found a copy, and it turned out to be Joseph Needham's own copy, in the Imperial War Museum in London, at the Needham collection there of his papers, and um, so if you read, you know, over time, you know, if, you, if you're really assiduous, you might find. I, I was able to find uh, Colonel Schwabels. Uh, somebody had published that in a book somewhere, and um, that was it, really. And mm -hmm. sometimes you get little little pieces here and there, and then you read it. And you begin to assess, is what they're saying consistent with other sources of data that we can gather? That's how you figure out if something is true or not, right? You tell me you did something. Well, how do I know? I, I, I try and see if it's consistent with other things I know. And that's what I did. I sat down and began to look. And sure enough, it was consistent. These days, it's a lot easier, thank goodness. I can look online. If Frank Trouble says, we had a secret... Um, place where we uh, were creating, um, tells the Chinese, we were creating biological weapons at Fort Detrick, and it was octagonal shaped, and it looked like a giant bomb, and it was centered. Wow, guess what? I could find online evidence that, that Fort Detrick had a building exactly like that, and it was used, in fact, for this purpose. Mm. So he was telling the truth. Now, whether he was coerced to tell the truth is a separate story. 
You know, by the way, Joseph Needham himself felt, and I believe this too, that if there were no confessions by U.S. Airmen, psychologically, it changes the dynamics of this story. But factually, not really. He felt that he had more than enough scientific evidence based on the data about looking about where insects fell, you know, the, the pathology reports, the, you know, um, and all the other evidence that they had gathered, witness evidence, the bomb casings, et cetera, you know, to make the case the U.S. was using biological warfare without any confessions at all, that they were just, you know, another aspect, another piece of the puzzle that they were using to put together, but not the necessary piece. And I agree with them. But it is a fascinating story. It's what drew me in. Mm -hmm. And um, I do believe that um, when I've looked as I began to look at this more carefully, and that includes looking at the retractions that were later published um, by these uh, airmen. They were all con re recanted the confessions. Of course, they did, but um, what most people don't know is they did that under threat of court martial. <laughs> and they had been interrogated for hours on end on a ship coming back from North Korea, um, which took a while to get back to the United States. And um, I, I mean, from Korea, not North Korea. And uh, uh, they were interrogated uh, by over and over again. And one wonders to what degree they were brainwashed. In other words, not by brainwashed in the popular sense, that they were coerced to tell a version of truth, if you will, or a version of that the government wanted you to know or a story, you know, that they wanted you to know. And of course, they, you know, the man in charge of that was a CIA guy by the name of Boris Pash, which I mentioned in one of the articles. You do? Um, yeah, and you, you can read about it in the article. One, one that's not mentioned there that I'm going to write up, that you might have heard of, is Lieutenant Colonel James L. Monroe. Lieutenant Colonel Monroe um, was the officer, air staff uh, officer, uh, related to, at the time, planning and operational matters uh, concerned with the Far East Air Force Command. On, on Anyway, mm -hmm operation support for these kind of things mm -hmm. and his name appears on the documentation sent to the un about the recantations of the flyers um um, um confessions of use of germ warfare so what was james monroe who later would become the executive secretary and then later the leader of the society for the investigation of human ecology in other words the cia's mk ultra front mm -hmm. Monroe was mentioned, uh, given special citation and thanks by uh, the editor of a book called The Manipulation of Human Behavior, edited by Alfred Biederman, which was a collection of mostly CIA, MK Ultra related scientist discussion about the use of psychological torture and how to break individuals down. You know, uh, I believe, or we certainly have a lot of evidence um, already, and by the way, Monroe was later involved in research at SEER, it wasn't called SEER then, it was called Survival Training Programs, the resistance portion of the program, you know, in studying and researching people in, involved in mock torture campaigns, which later occur, occurs to this day, by the way, um, but that the CIA does this kind of research. They study scientifically how to break in, individuals down. They study um, differences in their biology. They study differences in their background. They study differences in personality. They stay in intelligence. They look at every aspect from a scientific standpoint of how to break individuals down. And um, they're the ones that were doing this. Their own people said that the Chinese and the North Koreans really didn't do anything much different than police did around the world. Kind of the third degree, if you will. Mm -hmm. That was the brainwashing that was involved insofar as there was brainwashing. But as I said, when I look at it, I believe that it wasn't all one thing. I believe that the higher officers who confessed, the colonels, um, of which there were a few, that they more um, coercion was put upon them. We would I would call it torture, so it's use of solitary confinement, primarily some stress positions and um, threats, I think, were made to them as well, or at least they claimed they were. The Chinese in North Korea say, of course, we didn't do any torture at all. So. It's an open question, but I'll even accept that they did. But that doesn't change the fact that what they wrote, if you look at the what they actually wrote, they claimed for years, oh, it was just gibberish. They said crazy things. No one could believe it. But they didn't want to show you what they actually said. And when you see what they actually said or read what it is, you find out it makes total sense. 
Jeff, right. as, as, as we uh, wrap up here, I want yeah. to ask you to share with our listeners the incidents that occurred in Kangsu in South Pyongyang province. The date of yeah. this is March 25th, 1952. And in context, yeah. you say that this is about nine months into the Korean conflict. And uh, yes. pick up there with the story of the dispersion of these fleas in this town and how they impacted the water supply. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a young peasant who's about 26 years old, Pak Hyun Ho, and he uh, was having trouble sleeping on the night of uh, March 25th, 1952, because there was a, a, a plane that was circling around his village. And uh, he knew it was an American plane, I guess, because there weren't, there weren't other planes. It wasn't like North Korea had planes circling villages. And uh, they had heard tales of, of people, you know, I mean, of planes. Of course, they were dropping bombs everywhere. And, they, you know, he certainly knew about the tales of use of biological warfare. So he goes to get water in the early dawn hour. Uh, and um, it's like a communal water jug with a giant opening, you know, about almost two foot wide to get your water out, you know, some, you know, some yards away from the village. And he sees a bunch of fleas floating, you know, he'd never seen that before, floating on the, the surface of the water. And he runs back, uh, he figures he should report it, finds his friend, they go and report it. And, you know, there had already been set up, because by the way, the, the, the charges of, of biological warfare predate 1952, um, which is when the, the, the campaign really sped up. But there had been earlier cases in fact, the, the North Korean foreign minister had protested the use of biological warfare agents to the United Nations um, in 1951, you know, some months earlier um, than, than uh, Pak Yan Ho's finding. So, you know, sadly for him, uh, he contracted plague, plague, a disease which, by the way, had not been in North Korea, had been documented in North Korea in, over, in about some, approximately 500 years. Mm -hmm. Now suddenly there were cases of plague popping up. Um, and they all seem, seem to follow, according to uh, uh, International Scientific Commission um, um, interviews with hundreds of witnesses, followed American planes and, 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 and people seeing things drop from these planes. Um, and uh, he contracted plague and died, uh, uh, you know, within a week or so. Uh, you know, certainly I wrote this up. I mean, many people died during the North Korean War. Really, millions died. It's horrible to say. And um, he's just one person. But I wanted to humanize it and show you that, you know, what it was like. You know, how did they really find these? How did they handle, you know, what did they do when they heard that there was uh, fleas? You know, a, a uh, they'd already had a... Uh, epidemic prevention corps that had been created by the government to come out and deal with these things. So they're, they're out there by, you know, four or five hours later and they're investigating, you know, the fleas and they're sending them to laboratories, you know, and they're also destroying them. They destroy, but mainly it's a public health thing. So they would, one of the things that they discovered from the, the use of biological weapons, and uh, this was something that the Chinese learned during uh, the unit 731 years in World War II, was that if you have a really good public health program and you really mobilize the society um, and you, uh, um, uh, you know, become kind of insect freaks and try and wipe out insects wherever you can, that you can mitigate to a great deal, the, at least the use of insect vectors um, in the use of uh, um, uh, biological warfare. In many ways, the U.S. biological warfare campaign was a failure. And uh, it was they truly underestimated the determination of the North Korean regular people, just peasants like, you know, Pak Yun Ho and his sister who took care of him um, to uh, to be mobilized, to, to be vigilant and to, you know, to to work against these kind of things. But not everyone survived. And um, I think I mentioned in the article that about a month or so before. Um, Pack died. Um, there had been another attack in another village, and, and some uh, two or three dozen people died in that pl attack of plague. Well, let me, let me let me quote you. Right, uh, there were seven incidents, the earliest dating from uh, the 11th of February. Six of them, yeah. the presence of the plague bacteria was demonstrated, and in the village of Balnamri, uh, out of a population of 650 
uh, were infected with plague and 36 died. Is there an estimate yeah. for uh, the, you know, total population of people who were infected uh, by these uh, purported uh, American biological weapons? No. Okay. I'm sad to say, and I've looked, uh, and I've looked, uh, um, there isn't, I mean, I would I certainly wish, and maybe if there is a greater, uh, peace process that does occur with North Korea or China, that, uh, they would be willing to open up their archives about this. And um, when they opened up the archives around unit 731, um, what came out was that there were far more deaths, um, thousands more deaths than had previously been reported. One belief that I've read is that they didn't want to report how many people had died is because, so they underestimated it because they didn't want the Americans to think they were doing well. Or they certainly just didn't want the Americans to know how effective their campaign was at all. So mm-hmm. that's hence the secrecy. And um, in fact, the Americans, if you read, if, for those who read the ISC report, you'll see that you know, there was a campaign to actually send covert, you know, to send spies co- to covertly surveil the health situation in North Korea. Um, to see the effectiveness of the biological war campaign. Mm-hmm. Some of those spies were caught, by the way, and one of them was interrogated by the uh, ISC or interviewed um, uh, to talk about you know, the orders he got and, and what that was about. So unfortunately, we don't know. Um, it's believed to be low or at least far lower than you would imagine for a campaign of this sort. Um, but... Uh, um, and that's sometimes used as evidence um, when people today will talk, oh, this was a fake. If that was true, where's all the people who died? Mm-hmm. You know, well, back in 1952, when the International Scientific Commission published their findings, one of the, they were quite open about the question that there certainly didn't seem to be that many deaths. And, you know, they discussed that. And mm-hmm. that discussion is in the report. I'm not going to go into all of its details. Now people can read it. Um, so this isn't something new. In fact, I found in every case where there was an instance, because these people were so rigorous, and they looked at what disconfirming evidence they could have. For instance, you mentioned there were seven incidents also where fleas were just numbers of fleas were discovered after the passage of American planes. But only six of them had plague bacteria, only six of them. But what about the other one? If this was a fake, why not all of them? Why it was in other words, it was scientifically disconfirmed. And there are a number of places in the report where you will see, oh, you know. They said that this was a had plague or some other virus, but it didn't. Or they said this was an insect. Guess what? It was misinterpreted. One other, um, and I'm working on this right now. I'll, I'll close with. Uh, I'm working on an analysis of a previously uh, recent, only very recently declassified American signals intelligence reports and commentaries made by CIA individuals uh, during during the Korean War itself. These were top top secret um, cables. Um, from the field because uh, uh, that the United States had been able to uh, decrypt and and, and uh, listen into North Korean and Chinese radio operations and cables that were being made about this situation on a real-time basis. And um, the only thing that, that slowed them up a little bit was translation. Um, but they got it down to within a couple days. And Anyway, they declass- the CIA declassified a bunch of this. I've recently looked online, and they're pulling some of them away now. Oh, really? Uh, but I've got yeah, they really are. But I've got all of them, mm-hmm. um, and uh, too late for them, and uh, and other people to have them all. Anyway, what it shows is that the North, you know, uh, you'll get a cable like the North Koreans saying, uh, "Please don't send us this. You know, this is wrong. This was uh, please don't. This sample does not have biological stuff in it." Uh, uh, germ warfare, germ warfare materials, and you're you're mistaken. They wanted the real thing. They were even even the CIA people admitted that the North Koreans were looking very seriously for evidence of you know uh, real evidence that they could use on on the use of biological warfare, and they discounted others that weren't. This was a, this wasn't a hoax, as the Cold War um, Cold War scholars of today and the press who, who just slavishly repeat whatever they say, and don't do any research of their own. Um, will tell you, no, this was serious stuff. So sometimes you have to look for the dog that didn't bark kind of thing, mm-hmm. right? So when six of seven don't have plague, I mean, have plague, the one that doesn't is proof that they were honestly looking, right? That this wasn't a setup, this wasn't a hoax, this wasn't a put up, that they were, this, this really happened. 
Well, Jeff, this is fascinating work that you're doing, and I, I thank you for sharing it with the public and talking with us about this today. As you alluded, the talks that are underway between North and South Korea that could expand into a plan to execute a treaty to formally end the 1950s Korean War will present an opportunity for full disclosure by the United States, and uh, we'll watch and see if that happens. I'm not terribly optimistic, but uh, it would be uh, a move that could really clear the air, uh, and pardon that if you take it as a pun. Uh, but, yeah. but, you know, this is a, an area that uh, the U.S. should be forthcoming on, and I hope that we'll see some honest disclosure uh, in the coming months. Dr. Jeffrey yeah. Kay, thanks for joining me today. Great talking with you again here at Who, What, Why. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Thanks for listening to this Who, What, Why podcast with Dr. Jeffrey Kay. Send your comments to me, peter at peterbcollins.com. And please be as generous as you can and support the work of independent investigative reporters here at Who, What, Why.